Good morning. I bring you greetings from God, our creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, and our friend and companion on this journey, the Holy Spirit. I give thanks for each of you, whether you're sitting here in the sanctuary or whether you're joining us online. It truly is a gift to be able to gather together in the presence of our God. For those who may not know, my name is Tom Abbott. I'm blessed to be one of the pastors here at First Presbyterian Church in Salida, Colorado, and I have the great gift of sharing that pastoral role with Hillary Downs and together with Liz. We'll be leading this time of worship, and we're grateful for Gaylene being our techno guru this morning. So thanks for, for Gaylene's presence as well. A few things about our life together. Moving forward, we will continue to meet together for in-person and online worship. If you're here in the sanctuary, we ask that you wear a mask throughout the service, that you follow the lead of the ushers in exiting the sanctuary after worship, and we ask that you move directly outside before spending time greeting each other. This week, there's only one Zoom meeting, uh, the Monday morning prayer meeting. Next week, we'll return to having two Bible studies on Wednesday. If you're in that 70-plus category and would like to sign up for a vaccination, but you're having a hard time doing that, uh, we would love to assist with that, so please give the church office a call. Today we have a couple special things happening. We're going to be receiving Leslie and Mark Ely into our midst as members today, and we're also going to be ordaining and installing elders. Um, so we're grateful that we have that opportunity uh, to be celebrating those events in our life together today. Well, we have begun a journey through the book of Genesis. In Genesis, we are invited to join in God's creative process. As humans, our role in the creative process is in the making of culture. Today, we continue to reconsider the kind of culture we are called to facilitate as followers of Jesus. As we consider that, listen to the wisdom that we receive about making culture from Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Listen to and for God's word to us. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Work six days and do everything you need to do. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to God, your God. Don't do any work, not you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your servant, nor your maid, nor your animals, not even the foreign guests visiting in your town. For in six days, God made heaven, earth, and sea, and everything in them. He rested on the seventh day. Therefore, God blessed the Sabbath day. He set it apart as a holy day. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. As we enter into worship, let us pray. God of grace and light, Lord, we give you thanks today for gathering us together as you have. God, we thank you for the space and time carved out of a busy week for us to rest in your presence, for time and space to worship and pray and breathe and remember all your goodness that has been showered upon us. God who forgives, we repent of all of the ways that we turn from you. You call us, but so often we do not listen. You show us your path, but we prefer our own way. Forgive us, heal us, lead us back to you so that we might show mercy and grace to others in return. And God, as you forgive, open our minds and our hearts to your word today that we might be encouraged and fed and renewed. Amen. 
Well, our scripture reading today comes from Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. So let's listen to God's word to us here in Genesis. Heaven and earth were finished, down to the last detail. By the seventh day, God had finished his work. On the seventh day, he rested from all his work. God blessed the seventh day. He made it a holy day, because on that day, he rested from his work, all the creating God had done. This is the story of how it all started, of heaven and earth when they were created. Amen. The book of Genesis was written to the Jewish people who were dispersed through the Assyrian and the Babylonian empires. They were refugees, torn from their homes, separated from their land and their people. They were slaves. They were the victor's plunder. It is with the ears of refugees through which we want to hear the words of the creation story. The story of moving from chaos to order. The story of being invited into God's process of creation, which for us as humans is the process of creating culture. How does one create culture from the place of the oppressed? How can one hear God's proclamation that the creation is very good from the place of the oppressed? 
Well, I want to read the creation story with one foot in the shoe of the oppressed. We also want to read the story with one shoe in the foot of our own situation, where most of us are the privileged, living in a culture bitterly divided at the moment. From our vantage point of this present moment, from a place of privilege, how do we hear this story of moving from chaos to order, this story calling us to be culture makers. Last Sunday, we discussed the critical point that humans are a tertiary part of the creation, not the pinnacle of creation. We also discussed that God created humans in the divine image so that we can join in the divine role of responsibility, of caregiving, of stewardship, of servanthood. As Walter Brueggemann wrote, creation is God's decision not to look after God's self, but to focus the divine energies and purpose on the creation. We have a God who created not to serve God's self, but to be a blessing to the creation itself. For the Jewish refugees to hear God defined as steward would have been a radically different concept of God than the many gods of the Assyrian and Babylonian empires, the gods in the culture where they lived. The same is true for us. The gods of our American culture do not espouse to stewardship, caregiving, responsibility, the God described here at the beginning of the biblical story is a different kind of God. The God of the Bible, the God of all creation, the God in whose image we are made, the God who calls the creation very good, the God who calls us into creative partnership is a God of selfless giving. This God has made us in the divine image that we might choose the blessing of also being stewards and caregivers and responsible makers of culture. But of course, for this image of God role to be a blessing to us and to the rest of creation, it must be chosen. We must choose it, freely choose it. That's exactly the point Paul was making when he wrote this to the congregation in Philippi. If you've gotten anything at all out of following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being a community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, <laughs> then do me a favor. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourself long enough to lend a helping hand. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, became human. Having become a human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death. And the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. Like Jesus, then, be energetic in your life of salvation, reverent and sensitive before God. That energy is God's energy, an energy deep within you. God himself willing and working at what will give him the most pleasure. Be energetic in your life of salvation, reverent and sensitive before God. The energy is God's energy, 
an energy deep within you. What God gives God pleasure is when those of us who have been made in the image of God choose to be a blessing, to be servants, just as Christ did for each of us. This choice takes energy. It's not an easy choice. It may not even be a natural choice, but it is the choice that will bring blessing to the world, to God, and to us. Because the act of creating, the act of culture making, the act of pouring oneself out for the sake of others takes energy, it makes sense that the seventh day of creation, the pinnacle of creation, is not about more creating, but about rest, Sabbath rest. God, of course, did not need to rest. God simply chose to take time to cherish the blessing that comes from pouring energy and love and care into the creation. Thus, God set this day of rest, this day of reflecting, as an example for all of humanity to follow. Because the Holy Spirit lives in us, we have the very power and energy of God flowing through us. But unlike God, we are finite creatures. And thus, our energy is not limitless like the energy of God. Thus, the example of Sabbath rest becomes codified as law in the fourth of the Ten Commandments. And the commandments are gifts to make our lives more joyful and less complicated. Walter Brueggemann wrote, The Sabbath discloses something about the God of Israel. The Creator does not spend his six days of work in coercion, but in faithful invitation. God does not spend the seventh day in exhaustion, but in serenity and peace. In contrast to the gods of Babylon, this God is not anxious about his creation, but is at ease with the well-being of his rule. The gods of culture are anxiety-producing. The gods of power, of greed, of acceptance, of success move us toward anxiety, stress, and fear. The gods of culture want us to believe that there is never enough, that we must keep striving. The gods of culture want to wear us down, wear us thin, and put us in competition with one another. Brueggemann continues, the Sabbath is a charismatic statement about the world. It announces that the world is safely in God's hands. The world will not disintegrate if we stop our efforts. The world relies on God's promises and not on our efforts. The observance of Sabbath rest is a break with every effort to achieve to secure ourselves, and to make the world in our image according to our purposes. God rested to assure us that our God is in control, that God's work is very good, that we can trust in God. God commands us to practice Sabbath rest so that we have space in our lives for reflection, for celebrating God's faithfulness, for recharging our batteries for making culture. I am really bad at practicing Sabbath. I am really bad at practicing Sabbath because I struggle to trust that God is in control. I know that I'm not in control, but I work really hard hoping that I might be in control, right? But my primary struggle with practicing Sabbath is that I often wa worship the cultural God of affirmation. 
I hunger for people to see my hard work and be in awe. Or at least say, good job. I crave affirmation. It's one of my childhood wounds. It's a common wound, especially for firstborn kids. Many of us grow up seeking affirmation from one or both of our parents, but then rarely or never received what we were longing for. That wound haunts me. It haunts many of us. That wound makes it hard for me to practice Sabbath rest because how will I ever receive the affirmation I long for if I'm not working? You may have noticed that when we read our two scripture passages today that the day of rest was called holy in both passages, but it was not actually connected to the act of worship in either passage. There are gazillions, maybe not quite gazillions, but a lot of passages that talk about the worship of God. Worship is essential. It's essential for our lives. And worship can be a part of Sabbath rest. But Sabbath rest can be separate from worship as well. Sabbath rest is holy. Sabbath literally means cease. And holy means set apart. The Sabbath is a time set apart to cease activity. I start getting anxious just thinking about the idea of time set apart to cease activity. I am definitely connected to our cultural gods of success and affirmation and being in control. And yet... If I'm going to have the creative energy to pour into my made in the image of God calling of culture making, Sabbath rest is essential. Culture making is all about moving from chaos to order. If I simply focus my most intimate, if I simply focus on my most intimate culture, for example, the culture of my marriage, if I don't have energy to give to my marriage, it moves toward chaos and unhealth. If I care about my marriage, Sabbath rest is essential so that I have energy to pour into the culture of my marriage. This is true for every relationship, for every culture that we are a part of. If I don't take time for Sabbath rest, I don't have the creative energy I need to provide leadership for the culture of the church. If I don't take time for Sabbath rest, I don't have the creative energy to add something positive to the divisive, broken culture that we call America. Sabbath rest is a time set aside to heal to heal our wounds that come from our relationships, both our intimate relationship circles and our larger cultural and worldwide circles. Sabbath rest is time set aside to reflect and ponder and seek God's wisdom for living in this image of God role of culture making. For each of us, Sabbath rests will look different. The creative space to heal, reflect, ponder, seek God's wisdom will be a different experience for each of us because we each prefer a different kind of creative space. Setting apart time to be in that space, however, is essential for our role as culture makers. For the last 20 years or so, I've been going to monasteries for a week at a time and often more times than that and, and for less uh, long periods. For me, those times of quiet, times of multiple daily worship and time alone provide the creative space to heal, reflect, ponder, seek God's wisdom. Those times allow me to have the energy to be a culture maker. What about for you? Where and how does Sabbath rest happen for you? 
What gives you the energy to be a culture maker? God commands that we take a Sabbath rest because God knows what we need much better than we do ourselves. After all, we were created in God's image. Friends, let us be a people who choose to seek out God's gift of Sabbath rest. It will bless our lives, our relationships, and the world. Amen. Let's take some time to be in reflection about God's call for Sabbath rest as Liz plays. Well, today we get to invite uh, Mark and Leslie and Matthew up and um, get to invite them to become members of our fellowship. They've been a part of us for a while, but we're grateful that they're going to take this step of, of joining as members. And so Hillary and I are going to um, participate in their reception of them together. So come on down. Do you not have this? Oh, you don't? Okay. I'm doing it. You want to share it with her? Mark doesn't need it. <laughs> so come on up, you guys. If you guys want to just stand on the steps up there, that'd be good. Good. Great. Well, on behalf of the session, I present Mark and Leslie, who are joining by reaffirmation of faith. Do you want Mark to and Leslie, do I want to say anything? Say a little bit about say them. Say a little bit about them. Well, Mark and Leslie have been wonderful 
personal friends of mine. Um, for those of you who know that our young people traveled to Guatemala two summers ago, um, we traveled with a ministry, um, Pura Vida, that Mark and Leslie um, lead up. And um, so it's been a blessing to be part of that and to be in friendship with you as well. Also, if you're not aware, Mark keeps the office for Pura Vida upstairs in a, the old pastor's office upstairs as well. So Great. Yeah. And Matthew's about to have a birthday. And that's right. Matthew, are you going to be seven. seven in February, right? Matthew's in first grade. <laughs> cool. Well, you come to us as members of the one holy Catholic church into which you were baptized and by which you have been nurtured. We are one with each other, sisters and brothers in the family of God. We rejoice in the gifts you bring to us. As you join with us in the worship to which we were baptized, claiming again the promises of God, which are ours in baptism, hear these words from Holy Scripture. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Mark and Leslie, in Christ, our baptism is the sign and seal of our cleansing from sin and of our being grafted into Christ. Through the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Christ, the power of sin was broken and God's kingdom entered our world. Through our baptism, we were made citizens of God's kingdom and freed from the bondage of sin. Let us celebrate that freedom and redemption through the renewal and the promises that we make at our baptism. I ask you, therefore, to reject sin, to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, and to confess the faith of the church in which we were baptized. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? Who is your Lord and Savior? Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? You have publicly professed your faith. Will you be a faithful member of this congregation, share in its worship and ministry through your prayers and gifts, your study and service, and so fulfill your calling to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? Amen. Please join me in prayer. Holy God, we praise you for calling us to be a servant people and for gathering us into the body of Christ. We thank you for choosing to add Mark and Leslie to our family of faith. Together, may we live in your spirit and so love one another that we may have the mind of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom we give honor and glory forever. Amen. Amen. And then I just continue on. <laughs> Ever living God, guard your servants with your protecting hand and let your Holy Spirit be with them forever. Lead them to know and obey your word that they may serve you in this life and dwell with you forever in the life to come through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Welcome. We are so very yes. glad to have you as part of this church family in this new way. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And so, you Mark, you can stay put. Okay. Leslie and Matthew, Leslie if you want to go can. sit down, that would be great. Do you have the next part? I got this part. Good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, we want to invite um, Carrie and Phyllis to come join us up here. And Carrie has served as an elder in this congregation before, and so we'll be installing Carrie um, into this role. Um, for Phyllis and Mark, this is the first time to be elders, and so Carrie, if you want to come over here. Um, Why don't you guys stand up? On yeah, that? if you want to go up a step are or so, okay whatever you're comfortable. That. That's great. There. Good, good. Um, so we are super grateful that you were 
open to the call that you heard from God and from the nominating committee and from uh, the church itself. And so we give thanks that you're here to take on this critical role in our life together as the people of God. There are different gifts, but it's the same spirit who gives them. There are different ways of serving God, but it's the same Lord who is served. God works through different people in different ways, but it's the same God who achieves the divine purpose through them all. Each one is given a gift by the spirit to use it for the common good. Together, we are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Though we have different gifts, together we are a ministry of reconciliation led by the risen Christ. We work and pray to make Christ's church useful in the world, and we call women and men to faith, so that in the end every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Within our common ministry, some members are chosen for particular work as ministers of the word and sacrament or ruling elders. Through ordination and our installation, we recognize these special ministries. Remember that our Lord Jesus said, whoever among you wants to be great must become the servant of all. And if anyone wants to be first among you, they must be the slave of all. Just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life to set others free. Well, as a congregation, we give thanks and we celebrate the gifts that each of these people bring as service um, as an elder. Amen. In our um, book of order, this is what it says about the role of elder in our life together. As there were in Old Testament times, elders for the government of the people, so the New Testament church provided persons with their particular gifts to share in discernment of God's spirit and government of God's people. Accordingly, congregations should elect persons of wisdom and maturity of faith, having demonstrated skills and leadership and being compassionate in spirit. Ruling elders are so named not because they lord it over the congregation, but because they are chosen by the congregation to discern and measure its fidelity to the word of God and to strengthen and nurture its faith and life. Ruling elders, together with ministers of the word and sacrament, exercise leadership, government, spiritual discernment, and discipline, and have responsibilities for the life of a congregation as well as the whole church, including ecumenical relationships. When elected by the congregation, they shall serve faithfully as members of the session. Amen. Well, as we turn to the, the questions you get to answer here, I want to congratulate each of you on your election to the office of elder and trustee. And um, would each of you please respond to the following constitutional questions as found in our book of order. Do you trust in Jesus Christ as your savior? Acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, do you? Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you, do you? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith, as expressed in the confessions of our church, as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? And you do. <laughs> will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of scripture and be continually guided by our confessions, will you? Will you be governed by our church's polity? And will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you? Will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Will you? Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Do you? 
Will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you? Carrie, Phyllis, and Mark, will you be faithful elders, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in governing bodies of the church, and in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ, will you? Awesome. Um. <laughs> Would you, the congregation, please respond to these two questions? Do you, the members of First Presbyterian Church, accept Carrie, Phyllis, and Mark as elders chosen by God through the voice of the congregation to lead you in the way of Jesus Christ? Do you? Do you agree to encourage them to respect their decisions and to follow as they guide you, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? Do you? Amen. Well, typically, this would be where we would ask um, Phyllis and Mark to kneel, and we would invite folks who are ordained to come and lay hands on them, and we don't get to quite do that the way we normally do, because we can't have all of us so close together. Um, so Hillary and I are each going to lay hands on w one of them, um, but I would encourage everybody else to just put your hand out like this, and we're going to reach out and we're going to be touching these dear friends as they uh, move into this role of being ordained. So if you guys are able to kneel, great. If if not, that's okay, too. We'll figure out how to get you up. <laughs> so, oh, But let's pray. Almighty God, in every age, you have chosen servants to speak your word and lead your loyal people. We thank you for Carrie, Phyllis, and Mark, whom you have called to serve you. Give them special gifts to do their work, and in the laying on of hands, fill them with the Holy Spirit so that they may have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus and be faithful disciples as long as they live. Lord, you have called these friends into a common ministry as ambassadors of Christ. Give each of them the knowledge of your presence in their lives. Help them to feel supported by each other and the church as they strive to serve you faithfully. Fill each of them with your wisdom so that they may lead the church wisely. And most importantly, be with each of them as they intentionally seek to follow you. All this we ask in Christ's most precious name. Amen. Amen. Mm. You can stand. <laughs> well, you are now, before you go back to your seats, you are now elders in the Church of Jesus Christ and for this congregation. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let's welcome them. Congratulations. Woohoo! <laughs> Yay! And you can return to your seats now. Yeah. And as you have an opportunity in this strange time we're living in, please. Uh, give thanks to Carrie and Mark and Phyllis for their willingness to serve us in this way. Yes, thank you. And let us pray. O oh Lord, our God, maker of heaven and earth and every little and big thing within it, we give you thanks for the wonder of creation and that you have included us in it, that you have given us good work to do in caring for this creation, and that you have called each of us to be your friend. God, we thank you for the rhythm of days and of life, for the rhythm of work and rest, and we pray that we would remember that rest is essential for the health of all life in our world even ours. God, the world seems to spin so quickly that we often forget to stop and lift to you the concerns that are on our hearts. 
But here, we pause to breathe in your spirit and release to you all that we hold on to so tightly. God, we give you thanks and we give you praise for a peaceful inauguration of a new president this week. We recognize that this is a source of joy for many and a source of anxiety for many others. Change can be challenging and bumpy. And we pray for our elected leaders to lead well with honesty and integrity and with the best interest of all people at the heart of what they do. For the fractures that exist in our nation and among the people of our nation, Lord, we pray for healing. We pray that light would dawn. We pray for reconciliation between those who see the world so differently from one another. God, we lift to you today our troubled world. We think of places where injustice rules the day and where fear is a way of life. Where scraping by or going without is simply just the way it is. It isn't meant to be this way, we know. We know that such brokenness and hunger and need is not what you have ever wanted for humanity. Help us to heal our world, Lord. Help us to find the ways we can to get to the root of what's wrong and bring healing and restoration. God, we pray for your light to break into the darkness, to bring healing and hope. And we thank you for leaders of all kinds who have risen from even the most unlikely places to bring aid and healing where it's most needed. We pray that you would guide and protect them in all that they do. God, we pray for your church in this world too, that as it seeks to bring hope and healing in its own way, that it really would do so. We mess it up so often, Lord. Help your church to be a light in this world that points people to you. God, we pray now for those who are near to us that we know who are struggling. God, we pray today for Jenny Dieslin, who suffered a broken hip this week. Pray that you would bring quick healing to her bones, that she might be up and well soon. We lift to you, Lord, all those who continue to suffer from illness caused by the coronavirus. And we pray especially today for Bob's sister, Ruth. We pray as well for Tom Scheidegger, the brother of Barb Scheidegger, as both those folks are in the midst of recovery from COVID. We give you thanks, Lord, that Tom is out of the ICU and we pray for continued healing of his lungs and his body. God, we lift to you today all those we know who are in the midst of a journey with cancer. And we continue to pray for healing for Margaret, for Beverly, and for Lori. God, we pray for Jim Hutchings as he continues in hospice care. We give you thanks for precious time with his family. And we pray, Lord, that your spirit would be very near to them. And God, we pray for all who grieve right now, for everyone who has lost a loved one and whose lives feel shattered. And we continue to pray for Velma as she grieves the death of her daughter, Cheryl. We pray as well today for Karen Edmonds and Guy Edmonds and their whole family at the death of Karen and Guy's father, Clyde. And God, we continue to pray for families as they navigate marriages, and kids, school, work, friendships, and family. Life is big and complicated sometimes. God, we ask that you would be our rock, be the one who steadies us. We pray for all people who are going through big changes right now, that you would be the steady spot in those changes. And we thank you, Lord, that we can trust that as our creator and our redeemer and our sustainer, that nothing is too big for you to handle. So we praise you, God, for all that you do, for all that you are. May we always seek you first. 
And God, we pray all these things and so much more that we have not said this morning, all in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we head back out into the world, let us remember to set aside time for Sabbath rest so that we can be renewed and restored with the energy we need to be culture makers in this world, answering God's call to become a part of the creative process. Join me in our unison benediction. Wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, God has a purpose in you being there. Christ, who indwells you, has something he wants to do through you where you are. Believe it and go in his grace and power. The peace of Christ be with each of you this day and always blessings on your week. Thank you so much for joining us in worship. Have a great day.